All right, welcome back everybody to uh, 162. We're gonna pick up where we left off uh, discussing various demand paging techniques from last time. Um, as I've said before, make sure to um, type in the, um, make sure to type in the uh, chat if you have any questions and not to worry, it's a fake background. So yes, I'm sheltering inside. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to remind you uh, is we've been talking a lot about caching and, and I kind of joke that pretty much everything in operating systems is, is a cache. Um, but uh, if you remember, we talked about this before, uh, one way to compute the effective caches is to compute the average memory access time. And we uh, talked about that last time. Um, and that's sort of the average memory access time is hit rate times hit time plus miss rate times miss time. And then of course, uh, you know, the hit rate plus the miss rate is equal to one. That's just a probability statement. The hit time is the time to get the value from the cache if it's there. So, you know, that depends on the speed of, of this uh, cache itself. Uh, the miss time is the time basically that uh, you incur when you miss. And that involves both grabbing it from the DRAM and then getting it to the processor from the L1 cache. So typically that's hit time plus miss penalty, those two together. Now the thing we didn't talk too much about is the miss penalty, which is the uh, average time to get a value from the lower level, in this case from DRAM, okay? So that's what miss penalty L1 is. This is the total time on average to uh, pull something from DRAM. And if you put all these things together, you get this other uh, version, which is equally valid of average memory access time, which is the hit time of the L1 cache plus the miss rate times the miss penalty. Okay, and, and if you look at these very carefully, uh, these two versions of AMAT are the same. Now, the reason I wanted to just briefly bring this up, and again, this is 61C, is uh, if we have more levels, like an L2 cache, or perhaps there's a TLB in front, um, we start out exactly the same way. So the average memory access time is gonna be the time on average to pull from the L1 cache. So if you notice, this uh, is exactly as it was above. But now we have something interesting, because the missed penalty for grabbing something from below is actually the average time to pull something out of the L2 cache, which is surprisingly, not surprisingly, hit time of L2 plus miss rate of L2 times miss penalty. Notice that this isn't the exact L2 version of this. And so what is miss penalty L2? Well, that's now the time to get from the DRAM. You put all these together and you get the average memory access time for this second version with two levels of cache is the hit time of the L1 plus the miss rate of the L1 times uh, the hit time the L2 plus miss rate of the L2 times miss penalty. And if you wanted to put three, four, five, however many levels uh, of cache in there, um, this would just keep recursively uh, writing out like this. And so this, by the way, is one of the reasons I really like this uh, second version of the AMAT is it's uh, very cleanly hierarchical. And so basically you can do this recursively for many more levels. All right. Um, so uh, one of the ways we were actually using something like average memory access time, which we're going to call effective access time when we've got the disk involved here, is really the hit rate plus the miss rate times miss penalty. That's exactly what I just showed you, except in this time, in this case, the hit time is the time to get it out of the DRAM, uh, and the miss time is the time to go to disk. And notice the difference here, 200 nanoseconds that's 10 to the minus nine, versus eight milliseconds, that's 10 to the minus three. Those are very different times. Uh, and then we did this last time, we said, well, the average time is really that 200 nanoseconds, that's the hit time up here, plus the, the miss rate, which is a probability we fail, uh, fail to have it in the DRAM, times the time to go to disk. We normalized the units. And then we gave you a couple of examples here. So if, for instance, one out of a thousand page references cause a page fault, We've already slowed everything down by 40. So this is much worse than the hardware case where we're just talking about DRAM to cache. In this case, when we're talking disk to DRAM, uh, that disk is really slow. And you can do a kind of a different computation if you want to know what if the uh, slowdown is less than 10%, then you can um, basically figure that out, uh, which basically means that um, my time is no more than 1.1 times 200 nanoseconds. And that turns out that I can't afford more than one page fault in 400,000, or uh, basically I have more than a 10% hit. All right, so I just wanted to repeat that. Uh, and of course, what's interesting, given maybe what I just showed you last time, is you could put a cache in front of this. So, you know, the average, so that, uh, you know, this hit time uh, 
would actually be used in the previous equation, hit time plus miss rate plus miss penalty, you could use this uh, effective access time here uh, in the place of L2 if you wanted. So make this the DRAM and make this the disk or whatever. So this hierarchical measurement is in general useful. Okay, I'm gonna leave that, but I just wanted to make sure that there weren't any questions on that before I leave it. Are we good? Okay, so I would expect that uh, everyone here would be able to do this, by the way. Um, so uh, it wouldn't hurt to look through these slides and uh, ask your TAs if you want. Um, so now where we were last time, oh, so what was the conclusion from this slide? The conclusion from this slide was we really can't page fault. And in fact, if, we're, if we have any significant faults, we're gonna burn all of our performance. And so what that says is it's really important to get your replacement policy correct so that you don't have to worry about um, page faulting very often and so that you keep all of the uh, pages you really care about in memory. And so this is uh, one way to look at this. Uh, we talked about the clock algorithm as a version that's like LRU. And there's a single clock hand that advances only on page faults. And uh, what we do is every time we advance the hand, we're assuming we're looking for a new page. And when we do that advancement, what we see here is uh, that uh, we first check and see if that page has been used recently. And if it hasn't, we go ahead and use it. Otherwise, we clear the use bit and go on to the next one. And so the key thing to remember is the clock algorithm, as we described it last time, is about finding um, a, an old page, not the oldest page. And so um, the bits in the page table entry that are useful to us, I didn't list this at the end of the lecture last time, but the use bit, uh, the modified bit, the valid bit, and the read-only bit. And uh, we'll talk more about this in a moment for other, uh, other approximations of LRU. But again, what I'm talking about here is each time you move the hand, you check this use bit. And if the hardware has set the use bit uh, to a one, then you know in the last time that you went all the way around this clock hand, uh, somebody has touched the page. And so that means it's not an old page, it's a relatively new page. And so you'll clear the use bit to zero and then keep advancing. And if a bit stays, if the use bit stays zero all the way around, then you know that that uh, page hasn't been used in one loop. The modified bit, of course, is also supported in hardware typically, and that tells us whether somebody has modified the page since it was paged in. Okay, are there uh, any questions? So the clock algorithm, just to, to give you another uh, way to state it, is pages are all in a ring. So basically every page is linked together. We move the clock hand along that ring. And on a page fault, we move the clock hand, we check the use bit. One says it's uh, been used recently, so we clear it again. Uh, zero says it's a selected candidate for replacement. And it's really a crude partitioning of pages into old and new. Okay, I wanna pause there to see if there were any further questions. Yes, I, I wonder. Does uh, keeping track of uh, the, these these bits uh, th does that happen in the operating system, or is that more of a hardware thing? Well, so that's a good question, and the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> it can be done in many ways. So the way I've described it to you so far, uh, the use and the modified bits are entirely handled in hardware. Um, that's not going to be true in the next couple of pages, but for now, next couple of uh, slides. But for now. The way I've described this is the hardware for a page that's been mapped and valid will set the use bit every time you do a, uh, a load or store to one of those pages. And the modified bit will be set in hardware every time you do a store to one of those pages. Okay? All right. And the advantage of clock over LRU uh, is the question, what is the advantage? And the answer is, um, the advantage here is that uh, the clock algorithm, we can do really inexpensively. All we're doing is linking all the pages together and we're just sort of traversing them one at a time to check their use and modified bits. The problem with LRU, as I mentioned last time, is in principle to get the actual least recently used, you would have to track every load and store and keep rearranging all the pages uh, so that you could actually figure out which page was the oldest. 
And that was leading us to want an approximation because that would be way too expensive to have in the operating system. So that answer that question? All right, so here is our PTE. And if you notice, we've been talking about a couple of bits. Here's the dirty bit. Here's the accessed or use bit. Okay, here's the write only or writable, excuse me, bit and the uh, valid bit, which is a P. Okay, and do we really need the use and dirty bits? Okay, and that's uh, the accessed or dirty bits. Um, and the answer is, well, no, you can emulate them in, so in uh, software. So if you keep software structure um, in your operating system, you have actually uh, your own versions of use, dirty, writable, and present. And by the way, I, uh, when I put this on here, I thought it would help, but I apologize. The, uh, the access bit A is the same as the use bit. Okay, so my apologies there. Um, I will uh, clean up those slides um, for later. But uh, anyway, you can emulate these bits. So the question previous was, previously was, do they have to be in hardware? Well, ideally they're in hardware, but if your hardware doesn't have them, then you emulate them in software. And the way you do that is you keep a data structure that for every uh, mapped page keeps track of what the uh, page table entry use dirty, writable, and present bits are. You mark all the pages in the physically in the PTE as invalid. So that means mark presence is zero. Okay. And uh, what does that mean? That means that even though the uh, page is in memory, every time we go to try to reference it, we're going to get a page fault because the page table says it's not valid. But because we're keeping the real presence bits in uh, our own data structure, that means that as soon as the page fault happens, we take a look and we say, oh, wait a minute, this thing is actually supposed to be present. And it, you know where it is in physical memory because of a, the data structure here as well. And therefore, what I know is happening is I am using the invalidity of this page to for, figure out the use bit, okay, for instance. And so if we read an invalid page, we trap to the operating system. If the page is actually in memory, we set the use bit, mark the page read only. Um, and otherwise, we actually handle a page fault and go to disk, all right? On a write to one of these invalid or potentially read-only pages, we are going to set the use bit in software, the software use bit, and um, set the dirty bit in software. And as a result, we are um, now emulating use in dirty bits directly by page faults. And uh, that gives us the ability to use hardware that may not have those things directly in, um, may not support the use in dirty bits directly. Uh, and so when the clock hand advances, of course, we check the software use in dirty bits. That's the one we have in software and uh, to decide what to do. And if we're not uh, reclaiming, we're going to mark the page table entry invalid again and reset the software use in dirty bits for the next loop. So the question we have here is, how would you know when to clear the present bit? Uh, would the software not know which pages the MMU is removing? So the answer here is, uh, that's a great question. And uh, let me repeat what I just said. So we actually have the hardware page table entry and the software operating system structure. The software operating system structure is keeping track of which pages are actually in memory and where. And so all we're doing is we're now uh, emulating these D and A bits by playing with the P and W bits. And so um, pretty much every uh, virtual memory system that, um, that's out there has the ability to mark a page table entry as invalid uh, or uh, read only. And so with these two hardware bits, we can now uh, simulate the software ones. But in answer to the question of does the software know which pages the MMU is uh, keeping track of, the answer is the software is the king and knows what's actually in memory. And we're playing with the page table entries to generate page faults on exactly those places where we use a page on the first pass around the clock or we write to the page and that lets us actually simulate the use in dirty bits. Did that answer that question? So uh, remember, of course, that the clock algorithm is just an approximation to LRU. Can we do better? Uh, because if we don't have the uh, access to dirty bits or the use in dirty bits in hardware, we're page faulting a lot. We're essentially page faulting every time we go around the clock. And the question is, can we do something better? And the answer is yes, we can uh, use something called a second chance list. All right, so here's a different algorithm from the clock algorithm. And this showed up on the original VAX 
uh, um, hardware. And uh, I'll tell you in a moment, it showed up there as a as, um, mistake uh, because the hardware was designed and they forgot to put a use bit in. And uh, really not the hardware designer's fault. It was actually the operating system people told them they didn't need it. And they designed the hardware and it turned out they really wanted it. But the way this goes is instead of putting all the pages in a ring like we did with the clock algorithm, what we do is we, we divide them into two pieces and they're not necessarily equal chunks, okay? We'll talk about sort of how many pages are on each side in a moment. But the green side here are pages that we're going to order in a FIFO list. And uh, these are ones that are marked as usable in their page table entries and they're read, write, and ready to go. So that's why they're green. So anytime the operating system tries to use them, uh, they will just work, okay? Now, the yellows are pages that are actually in DRAM, so they're not on disk. They're, well, they're pulled in from disk, they're in DRAM, but their page table entries are marked as invalid. So if the uh, program tries to use one of these pages, even though it's in DRAM, we get a page fault the first time around. Okay, now we're going to call this the, uh, the active list and we're call this the second chance list. Now, uh, why is that useful? Well, we, uh, as I said, the, uh, we can access all the pages that are in the active list at full speed because they're marked as writable and present. Otherwise, we get a page fault. So that's either a page fault because we touch a page that's in the second chance list or we touch a page that isn't even in DRAM, it's out on disk. What happens there? Well. Whenever we get a page full, what we know is we're going to rearrange things a bit. So the first thing we do is we take, sorry, the oldest page uh, in the FIFO list and we move it to the second chance list at the end, okay? Oh, the other thing is I forgot to mention the green list is, uh, is FIFO and the second chance list is, is an actual LRU list like you would build uh, in software. Okay, so what we do is we take this page uh, off the end. These are the oldest. Uh, in the FIFO list, we pull that one down to the oldest in the LRU list, or the, uh, this is the, excuse me, this is the newest in the LRU list, okay? And we're gonna mark it as invalid because it's now in this second chance list. And then, uh, assuming for a moment that the page fault was because the page was on the second chance list, well, we'll give it a second chance by pulling it off this list, putting it at the new end of the FIFO list, and now it'll be green and easily access, accessed. So the way to think about this is ignoring for a moment pulling pages off of disk. Forget that. All we're trying to do here is do a good job of simulating use and dirty bits. Uh, and we're assuming for a moment that all of these items um, are already in DRAM. We just have ones that are in DRAM but marked invalid and ones that are in DRAM but marked valid. And this trick is an approximation to LRU. Why is that? Well, if the green list is, is uh, some small subset of the total pages, the yellow list is giving us actual LRU because every time we touch a page, uh, we're keeping this list in order and the newer ones on the list are put on the new end of the LRU and the old ones that haven't been touched are kept at the end of the LRU, uh, the LRU list. Now let's look at one more type of page fault. So the first type of page fault we looked at was uh, the page fault in which it's actually already in memory rather than on disk, we just have to change its status. The second one is if it's not on the list, we're gonna have to page in from disk. So in this case, what we do is we page in from disk and put that at the, the new end of the FIFO list. And we throw out an LRU victim at the, uh, the old end of the LRU list, put it back on disk. And as a result of what we just did here, we're keeping the total sizes of the, uh, the two lists the same, and um, basically the sum of things on green and things on yellow represent um, the total amount of DRAM pages. Okay, pause. Somebody asked me a question. And you're welcome to talk if you wish. So we're all good, huh? This is impressive. Okay. Well, let's let's Quick keep. Question. Can you hear me? 
Yep, go ahead. Um, what's the significance of having the green list being a FIFO list? So the significance of the green list being a FIFO list is the following. Uh, we can't do any better. Okay, now, and the reason that is, is because since these pages on the green list are all mapped as, um, they're all mapped as uh, valid and read write, loads and stores just go to those pages automatically and just work. So there's no way to rearrange these pages uh, based on anything about access patterns. And so the best we can do is we kind of put them in a FIFO list. I mean, there, there's just nothing else we could do because we're not getting any more information that we can use to make any decisions about this. The list is, did that make sense? Yeah. Great. And the ones in the yellow we can manage as LRU because the only time we ever touch the yellow list is on page full. So we're actually running software at that point. Now this was a um, question about how much this really saves us from the LRU slowdown problem. Um, the answer is, uh, is a good one here, which it says, uh, it seems like either you'd have enough green pages that you're losing the LRU benefits, or so few green pages that you'd end up stuck with a mostly LRU system. So the answer uh, to that is clearly there's a trade-off. Um, and in fact, you could imagine that if there are no yellow pages, you've got FIFO, okay? And we all know that FIFO is a bad idea uh, because you get Belletti's and non- um, you get Belady's anomaly, and as a result, pages that are really popular are going to get uh, pushed out to disk. Um, the other thing is, if all of the pages are in the second chance list, that is going to be uh, unfortunate because every access, every load and store is going to cause a page fall. Okay, why is that? Well, because if the green is empty, every access to a yellow page is going to cause a page fall. And so the answer to the question is that you've got to pick somewhere in the middle here to get the, the uh, sort of a nice benefit of getting enough uh, LRU that um, really popular pages don't get pushed out to disk, but um, not having so many page faults that the performance is bad. Okay, and going back to this again, uh, oh, in the, in the first case is the swapping atomic. Um, so, the question is, is, you're talking about, is this overflow uh, modification an atomic operation? Is that the question being asked? So let me, let me take a stab at what I think uh, is being asked. So when we, the only time we ever do any of these arrows, okay, is when we're coming in from a page fault. So that means that the operating system has control, the, the user program isn't running, so it's not, generating any page faults. And so none of what we do here can be affected by a, a page fault happening at the same time. So it really is atomic. And um, the other thing I wanted to point out is what is the LRU benefit here? So imagine that there is a page that's very popular, okay? And we put it on the green side, but eventually it becomes the old page. Now, if we had FIFO only, we would throw it out at that point. But instead, what we do is we put it onto the yellow list. And the yellow list is called a second chance list because if it really was popular, all that we have to do is take a quick page fault, pull it back to the green list at the front, adjust the page table entry, and now it's, got, it's gonna be in the green list for a whole pass all the way through again. And so basically, the yellow ones are the second chance uh, list of things that we might want to grab back immediately because they're popular and it's only if they sit around long enough to get all the way to the LRU end that then we potentially throw them out to disk. Okay. Are we good? Now, so we're going to pick an intermediate value um, and the result uh, of this second chance algorithm is we sort of eliminate a lot of the disk's accesses because page only goes to disk if unused for a very long time and uh, not very popular. Uh, the con is we have an increased overhead of trapping to the operating system, but if uh, we don't have a use and, um, and dirty bit in software and hardware, then this is kind of what we got to do, okay? Uh, and with page translation, we can, uh, we can adapt to any kind of access the program makes and uh, so this is a good example of using the page table entry 
to emulate something. So those page faults that we're getting in the middle here, like the one that causes an overflow, notice that's not actually pulling something in from disk. What it's doing is it's performing some operation, which is some rearrangement in the operating system, and then uh, making the page table entry valid so that when we retry, it just works. And so this is uh, another example, just like when we did copy on write and some of these others where we're using the page table entry for something other than necessarily demand pages. Um, now the funny little historical significance of this is why didn't fax include the use bit? Uh, well, you had a very uh, conscientious computer architect who talked to the OS people and said, you know, okay, what, what do you need? Let's talk it through. They basically told them they didn't need the use bit. And, uh, and so then they designed the VAX. And then, uh, you know, the VAX got built and they came back and they said, oh, wait, but we need a use bit. And uh, poor Strecker actually got uh, blamed for uh, forgetting to include it, but um, really wasn't his fault. And by the way, the VAX did okay anyway. And the second chance list kind of gave them their own version of the clock. Okay. So, with that being said, what if we go back to a moment for a moment just to uh, the hardware having the use and, and uh, dirty bits and see something else that we could do? So the way we've been talking about the clock algorithm is that whenever you get a page fault, you start moving this clock hand uh, to try to find a, a page that can be reused. Now, there are several problems with this. First is you're running a bunch of complex stuff on a page fault where what you'd like to do is find a physical page so that you can actually start the, uh, start the disk access uh, with DMA enabled. And so you really need a page even though the disk access is gonna be taking a long time. And the second is that some fraction of these pages are dirty and so you can't even use them as soon as you figure out that they're an old page, you've gotta actually start writing it back to memory or back to disk. So you can, uh, take care of these two uh, problems with one uh, solution, which is build a free list, which is exactly like a second chance list. This free list, uh, in the background, you run this clock hand. This is something often called the page daemon. And what the page daemon is doing is it's advancing this clock hand only when the free list kind of gets below a certain threshold. And it takes pages that are old and puts them on the free list. And notice that I have some marked red with a D, and that means that they have data they're dirty, that needs to be written back to disk, okay? And so what we do is we pull them off the clock and we put them in this list, and uh, this is a FIFO list. And what we do when we have a page fault and we need a new page is we pull something off the free list. And the good thing about doing it this way is the dirty pages get pushed out to disk, so we start that operation. As soon as it's finished, uh, this becomes green, and so these pages that they had here are typically read-only pages that don't have any dirty data in them and we can just overwrite them. So this is a second, a different version of a second chance list, uh, which is much more common in uh, modern operating systems with hardware that has a use bit. Um, so this is typically called the page out daemon and it gives us some time for dirty pages to get written back to disk. And the other thing is, why did I call this a second chance list? Well, should one of these pages need to be reused because somebody references it while you're going around the loop, then all you have to do is pull it back into the ring. And uh, so it gets a second chance. And so that page has uh, all of the time that it's sitting in the free list to get just pulled back into the ring uh, without having to come back off disk. All right. Um, and the advantage here is it's faster for the page fault uh, to get you in use because mostly we have free pages. All right. Now, uh, another interesting thing that you can imagine is this need for something which we're gonna call the reverse page mapping or a core map, which is a mapping. So if you think about what um, the virtual memory mapping mechanism we've been talking about maps from virtual address to physical address, okay? Uh, but as soon as we want to take a physical page and reassign it to some new address, we have to hunt down every page table that is mapping that physical data, okay? And uh, if you remember, we talked about sharing uh, a single page with multiple page tables. That's exactly the situation I'm talking about. If we wanna free up that physical page, we have to go hunt down um, all of the page tables it's in so we can mark them as invalid, okay? And so how do we do that? This is often called a core map or a reverse page mapping. 
okay, which hunt down all the page table entries pointing at a given page frame um, and uh, to see if they're active. Okay, and there are many implementation op options. Uh, you could, for instance, for every physical page, you could keep it a linked list of page table entries that it uh, points to. This is pretty expensive. Um, Linux actually has a, a slightly different uh, mechanism, which is a similar idea, but it takes chunks of physical memory um, in uh, read memory regions in chunks, and it frees them up uh, simultaneously. And so by taking chunks of pages at a time, Linux gets to um, uh, reduce the overhead of, remain of this core map. Okay, so um, now let's talk a little bit about allocating of page frames. So uh, who gets what? Suppose you've got a machine that's running and it's got, you know, 100 processes and one of them gets a page full, then what? So how do we allocate memory? Uh, you can imagine many, many options. You could say uh, maybe every process gets the same fraction of memory. Or maybe they get different fractions dependent upon um, priority. Maybe when our pages start getting, uh, we start needing a high demand of new pages, maybe we completely swap a process or two out to memory so that it's not even in memory at all, thereby allowing other processes more memory. Well. The starting point for this allocation question is that every process needs a minimum number of pages. And that's basically so that the process can make some forward progress without hitting a page fault. And for instance, if you were to take any given process, uh, or excuse me, any given hardware processor, you could figure out what is the minimum number of pages that need to be mapped so that the next instruction can always run. And for instance, in the IBM 370, you needed six pages because the instruction being six bytes might span two pages. There might be two pages to handle the from and two to the two. And uh, as a result, you could do th go through every one of your instructions and say, if this instruction happened to be the one that I stopped at because I was rescheduled or I had a page fault, how many pages would I absolutely need to have minimum before that instruction could be guaranteed to run? And so this number is a small number of pages, but if you violate that, you have so many processes in memory, that you can't even give six pages to every, say, process in this instant, then uh, you're really in trouble. You're really thrashing. Uh, so what are some scopes of replacement? Uh, one of them is a global scope. And, and in some sense, this clock algorithm, as I've been describing it to you, is a global replacement. It says that all pages from all processes are put into the same clock. And when a, when a, pl a process needs a new page, then it can uh, go to the global free list and select a page. And in that instance, it's basically competing with all processes by grabbing, taking away a page from a process that's running. You can also do local replacement, where each process selects uh, from only its own set of allocated frames. So suppose that we say, well, this process is going to get 100 pages in memory period. Then when it needs a new page, you could go and say, well, I'm going to just replace its one of its pages to, for the new thing I'm paging in. So this global versus local, both of these are options and they're used in different circumstances. A lot of OSs use the global replacement case because it's simple, but if you really want to have something more real time where you've carefully controlled what memory is uh, in use, then you might do a local replacement policy so that, so that one process cannot it impact the other one's uh, real-time guarantees. So let's look at some possibilities for uh, fixed priority allocation. So you could do this equal allocation. Every process gets the same amount of memory. So you could imagine 100 frames, five processes uh, total, and each process only gets 20 page frames. You could do a proportional allocation where uh, the bigger processes get more memory. So, you know, here we have sort of the size of process P, and we sum up the total sizes of everybody, and that sum is used as a fraction. So we take the size of a process over the total size times the amount of memory we've got, and that gives us the fraction of page frames we want. Uh, I don't know, can anybody think of, uh, this seems like it says give the bigger process more memory, and it seems almost like a good idea, but can anybody guess why this could be, 
not a good plan. Any thoughts? Yeah, great. I have a couple of folks basically saying processes can falsely claim to be large uh, in memory and as a result, get a lot of memory frames even though they don't need them, that's correct. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the size of a process may depend on a bunch of libraries you're linked in that have nothing to do with the ones you're actually using. Um, the other thing we could do is priority allocation, which is a proportional scheme using priorities so that higher priority processes get more memory. Um, these are all fixed schemes in some sense, and they're a little bit unsatisfying because either they're gameable, that's this proportional one, or they don't really reflect what the process actually needs to make forward progress. And so maybe we want an adaptive scheme of some sort. You know, what if some application just needs more memory? So uh, we'll, we'll get to that uh, better scheme in a moment. I don't have a lot of new administrivia other than to repeat that uh, this new normal is a little weird. Um, as you see, I have changed my background to be nice and soothing and no, I'm not outside. Um, but uh, make sure to wash your hands and uh, be, you know, practice good social distancing. But on the other hand, make sure to stay in touch with people. Use your tools, use Zoom, use Google Hangouts, uh, whatever you can, talk to people. Uh, phones, exactly, whatever you, yeah, whatever you can do. Um, I'm going to keep teaching 162. I love this class and uh, it's always better to teach in front of a live audience uh, so that um, we will keep going on this and see how it goes. Going to have live lecture discussion sections and sessions and office hours. Uh, I had somebody ask me earlier about my office hours and I very much apologize for not having any over the last couple of weeks. I've been trying to figure out what to do in this, this new normal, but I'm going to um, start having office hours again. And so uh, we'll see how that goes. I'll announce them and I may have a few a week or something because it's pretty easy to do virtual office hours for, uh, you know, I don't know, inspiration or conceptual ideas. Um, we're hopefully starting uh, tomorrow, you'll see in section, you'll see a recording walkthrough of the section as well. So that, um, that should be interesting. Uh, some of the deadlines got relaxed. You can see the Piazza Post. I say from this afternoon, I meant from, uh, from uh, Tuesday, sorry. And uh, we did move midterm two to April 7th, uh, which is the week after the week after spring break. I know we have some conflicts out there and uh, we are continuing to engage with you guys about those. Um, the material part of this is really for for us to figure out how we're going to do this uh, this midterm. But um, I would say the questions you have for now, the midterm is clearly going to be online, probably with Zoom proctoring. Um, but for now, keep your uh, conceptual view of this as a an online version of what we've already done, and we will uh, give you more details. Uh, as soon as we figure them out. We're kind of figuring out best practices from the midterms people have been doing. Um, and I do see some another suggestion on here um, on the chat list, which is a good one. You know, uh, I would say if you have access to sanitizer, your phones and your keyboards might be a good uh, thing to do as well. I realized last week that I almost never cleaned my phone. Uh, I have uh, remedied that. Okay, so the new discussion times are so far the same. Uh, there'll be one discussion section per time slot. Um, so exactly uh, as before from nine to four, whenever it was, you can be sure that every hour that uh, was a section will have a section for now. Um, there'll just only be one TA and I think they will be posting those links for you guys, hopefully, if they haven't yet on Piazza. So just watch for that. Um, but we're still doing, for now, we're still doing one per time slot. I think when we get into the, uh, after spring break, if uh, people are not necessarily back at Berkeley, one thing we may do is try to put in an earlier time slot, like eight o'clock uh, in the morning here for people that are on the on the East Coast or whatever, we, we'll see. We may adjust our time slots later. Um, okay, good. I see a suggestion about uh, how to get uh, good questions in office hours, and um, let's uh, let's talk about some of that stuff offline. 
but that's uh, those are some good suggestions. And actually, you could make a Piazza post about that. That would be good. Okay. So going back to our um, material. So um, one uh, thing we could do to try to dynamically figure out how many pages of process needed is uh, something like tracking page fault frequency per process. So could we reduce capacity misses uh, by dynamically changing the number of pages? So if you imagine that we say, well, this process is stuck at 100 pages, we're going to start getting capacity misses if it needs more than 100 pages. OK? And so if you were to look at this curve, which I showed you earlier, uh, in a slightly different context, you could imagine that the page fault rate for a given process is a function of the number of pages we choose to uh, give it varies. And uh, assuming we don't have Belady's anomaly, uh, because we're uh, doing something better than FIFO, then as we add pages, we're going to decrease the uh, page fault rate. And we could have an upper and a lower bound deciding that as long as our uh, page fault rate is within the lower and upper bound, we're good. And if we're above the upper bound, that process is thrashing, so we need to give it a, a few more pages. If we're below the lower bound, we could imagine that process has more pages than it actually needs, and we might want to give them to a different process. Okay, and so um, this is a pretty simple idea. Of course, we uh, might actually ask the question, what if we just don't have enough memory for everybody? But how would we know? Uh, how would we know? I have a question about this. Does this notion of uh, assigning a certain number and changing the number of uh, pages to a program only apply to the local pages case and not the global? Yeah, so this is, that's a good question. So the question was, does what we're talking about here apply to the local page allocation or global page allocation? So this is almost by definition a local page allocation concept because global page allocation just kind of shares them among everybody. Uh, you could you could modify the global clock to try to skip over pages for um, processes that were uh, underfunded in terms of number of pages. So you could use the global clock for something like this if you wanted. But for now, let's think of this as the local page allocation version. So, uh, so thrashing is when we don't have enough memory period. No matter what we do, oh, sorry, go ahead. So, oh, good. So the, and the question is, if all processes are above the upper bound, we know we don't have enough memory. Uh, that's correct. Actually, I would say if there's no way to get all processes below the upper bound, then we know we don't have enough memory. Um, that, that would be another way to look at this. And we have this notion of thrashing. And what I want to just show you here is if we look at adding more processes or threads to get a better performance out of the system, where we're trying to overlap I.O. and so on, um, in, in, uh, in the case of uh, multi-threading, we're trying to sort of get better use of pipelines and so on. We can add more and more tasks, but at some point, uh, we're going to stop getting better performance, and we're going to fall off a cliff here where just adding a few more processes, all of a sudden we're page faulting all the time and thrashing going back and forth to disk. And so if we're in this, uh, past this uh, cliff of no return, we know we're in trouble. And uh, really thrashing is uh, a situation where at least one, maybe more processes are busy swapping pages in and out with little or no progress. And uh, how do we detect thrashing? Well, we can start seeing that our uh, utilization is low or that we're basically spending all of our time with overhead of talking to the disk. And what's our best response to thrashing? Anybody have any thoughts? Yep, kill some processes. So that would be one option. But I think killing processes is uh, pretty drastic. Uh, we have several interesting ideas here. Um, adding more RAM, well, that's good long-term solution. Uh, I think uh, one that was brought up here is putting some processes on inactive is a good one. So uh, what we do in that instance is actually page out all of the pages of a given process, finish the ones, other ones that are running, and then bring it back. And as a result, what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the thrashing. Notice this is a supremely steep cliff. And so by deactivating some processes, we can actually get much better performance by putting them to sleep, running the other ones to completion, and then running the ones that uh, 
that were um, that we put out on disk. Okay. Another suggestion here was to reduce the amount of memory that some processes get. So that one is kind of what we're trying to do by tracking here. So at some point we notice if we have too many processes below our lower bound, we could try giving them to ones that are above the upper bound. And when we can't really do that anymore, then we're just hosed and we got to do something else. Okay. So let me um, remind you a little bit about memory access patterns. So we've done this a couple of times. We, we looked at a version of this last time, but here's an example of an actual memory traced uh, over time from a process. And if you look at which memory addresses are in use, you see that there are these periods. If we were to actually scan along and look at a time slice, we see like, for instance, in this one we just ended up at, that the addresses kind of in this region are in use, but the ones elsewhere are not. And so if we were to try to, if we could somehow figure out the number of pages that this process is actually using during this region, then that uh, might tell us sort of how many pages it really needs. Okay, and this is called the working set. And the working set defines to some extent the minimum number of pages needed for the process to perform well. Okay, and not enough memory for the working set of all processes summed, toge uh, summed together, then we've got thrashing. And that's the point where it might be better to swap out the process. So the working set model is pretty simple, is if you look at the references from a given process, and you take the last delta of them, and you look at them, and you count the number of unique pages in that past window, that will tell you that, for instance, the working set at this T1 time is pages one, two, five, six, and seven, but a little later, the working set at T2 time is uh, three and four. And so if we identify the, the pages that are in active use in any given time frame, then we both know how many of them are and we know which ones they are, okay? And we might be able to respond. So the working set window is a fixed number of page references. It might be a thousand of them. And so, uh, you know, this chunk here is the working set of process PI, for instance. And it's a total set of unique pages referenced in delta. And if delta is too small, you don't really get the whole locality. So if I, if I only look back a little bit, I might miss the pages that are in active use. If delta is too long, I might have gone from here to here. And now I, I would encompass both three and four and one, two, five, six, seven. And I'm not really uh, understanding enough about the changing access pattern of that uh, process. And of course, if delta goes to infinity, you're basically talking about every address or every page that that process accesses. So if we were to sum up the working set size of all of the running processes, that gives us how many physical pages we need in memory. And if the total number of pages in the working sets of all of the running processes is greater than the amount of memory we've got, we're at thrashing. Okay, and so you could imagine a very simple policy that when D is greater than M, you suspend or swap out all the processes. And that can really improve your, your working set or improve your performance. And um, notice that this is something that you can keep track of to some extent. And so if you're willing to do some uh, maintenance of information per process, then you can start making some of these kind of de decisions. Now, what about compulsory misses? So if you remember, compulsory misses are misses that represent the first time a process has pulled a page into memory. And uh, pay, you know, these are pages that are touched for the first time, or they're pages that are touched after the process is swapped out and brought back. And the question might be, can we uh, save ourselves from those? And we did talk uh, about um, prefetching in one sense, but one option here, which is actually used uh, by various operating systems is clustering. So on a page fault, you bring in multiple pages that are around the faulting page, that's a type of prefetching, and uh, since the efficiency of disk reads increases with a sequential read, then this can be a much more efficient than a series of accesses to disk. Now our very next topic, uh, next time, I guess after we get back from spring break, is really starting to talk about how disks work in, in physical disks and also SSDs. And uh, we'll talk about a few other storage uh, uh, devices. But basically with clustering, we can uh, do a really good job of pulling things in once we have that information. Now the question here is what sort of replacement policy comes with clustering? So you could think of clustering as a meta replacement policy, which is uh, a form of prefetching uh, 
that we only use when we pull something in uh, that hasn't been used for a while. So when we pull a process in off of disk for, uh, for the first time in a while, we might use the information that we stored with it as to which pages to pull in. It's also potentially something that we might use when we miss, we're actually, it's telling us which things to pull in. And so in both cases, it's not actually about replacement. This is about the pages you're pulling in. And the replacement question is really about uh, which pages are we replacing? And that's, that could be whatever replacement policy you have. So uh, I guess a simple answer to the question of what sort of replacement policy is, comes with clustering is, it's actually that clustering is a way to decide which pages to pull in, not which pages to throw out. I hope that helps. Uh, and we can do working set tracking, which is use some algorithm to track the working set of the applications. And when swapping a process back in, you swap in the working set. Now I wanna talk about just briefly, there's a type of clustering which is used by pretty much every operating system I know, uh, maybe not Pintos, but um, it's basically when you read a page, the simplest type of clustering isn't clustering at all. It basically says sequentially pull in the next N pages where n is typically small. And uh, this is used quite frequently. And it's, a, it's a, basically a, a bowing to the fact that most accesses in, um, pay, that are coming off of disk are sequential. And so if you access one page, you're likely to access the next couple of pages. And that's a very good policy in general. OK. So I want to switch gears for a little bit, and uh, unless there's any more questions on this. Alrighty, so um, let's talk a little bit about Linux uh, now, because that's sort of uh, the Unix style operating system you're likely to run into and get the chance to modify in your uh, careers as software engineers. And um, memory management in Linux is considerably more complex than the examples we've given. For instance, uh, Linux running on an x86 processor has to bow to the historical details of x86 processors, like for instance, memory below the 16 megabyte physical uh, realm was used for DMA, uh, DMAable memory on things that happened to be on the ISA bus, which is a, an old default bus that was used and, and still is to some extent for things like keyboards and mice and so on. There was a zone normal, which was 16 megabytes up to eight, uh, 196 megabytes, which is mapped above C1000 and I'll show, or C0000000. And then high memory is, is everything else. And so these three zones of physical DRAM were often measured, were often managed each with its own uh, clock-like LRU algorithm, okay? So each zone has one free list, two LRU lists, which is the active and inactive pages. And so it's actually doing something that has, it's like a cross between the clock and the second chance list. Uh, many different types of allocators. There's slab allocators, per page allocators, mapped and unmapped uh, allocators that uh, you will encounter in, in Linux, and many different types of allocated memory. So for instance, the notion of anonymous memory is memory that's not backed by a file. So a good example of that is the heap or the stack is often not backed by a file. It might be backed by the, uh, the swap drive but not necessarily by a file. And anonymous memory is another word uh, also for shared memory between two processes. And I'll actually, when we get into mem uh, memory map, mmap uh, system call a little bit later in a couple of lectures, we'll take a look at uh, memory that's anonymous as well as mapped memory. So it's possible in Linux, for instance, to, to execute mmap, mmap, and uh, map it to a file and then you can read and write the file by reading and writing memory as if the file was entirely loaded into memory. And uh, the page, uh, the man paging now is, is used to actually pull things out of the file and into DRAM on demand. Okay. And then there's allocation pro uh, priorities in uh, the way the allocator works, like is this blocking? Can you, can you put the uh, process to sleep when it allocates off of certain uh, zones of memory? Now, what's kind of interesting here is if you look at the difference between a 32-bit address space and a 64-bit address space, by the way, before the meltdown bug was discovered a couple of years ago, they typically looked like this, okay? And 32 bits is uh, no longer really a lot, okay? That's only four gigabytes, but 
what happened was the first three gigabytes of the virtual address space was granted to uh, the user. And then um, from, so from zero to C uh, in that, uh, that first uh, nibble. And then uh, from C to all Fs was kernel. And the kernel, among other things, would map the first 896 uh, megabytes of the uh, DRAM up into these kernel addresses directly. So when the kernel popped in uh, through a system call or an interrupt or whatever, it had a direct mapping for pretty much every physical page in the system, unless you had something more than 896 megabytes, in which case you had to swap in and out of the mapping in the kernel. When you get to 64-bit virtual space, there's just a lot, okay? Two to the 64 is just big. And it's so big that most processors don't even bother mapping all 64 bits of the virtual address space through a page table. It's just so big. So one of the uh, examples we gave a couple of lectures ago was really only mapping 48 bits of the virtual address space through page tables. And here's a good example of what happens with that. And so what's funny and what I want to point this out is we have what's typically called the canonical hole, which is a chunk of address space that's not available for mapping at all. So the kernel nor the user's page tables can use this space. And so what happens is the virtual addresses of uh, everything from uh, zero up through seven FFFFF, this is 47 bits worth of ones, are mappable. And then if that, um, and then the chunk up here from uh, FFF8 all the way up are also mappable and nothing in between. Okay, and you could kind of think of that as this uh, seven is basically zero, one, one, one as a nibble of four bits. And when the one gets set, you really set all of the bits. And so these are the only parts of the virtual address space that make sense. The user is only given access to these two to the uh, 47 um, uh, bytes worth of address space, and the kernel gets two to the 47 bytes of address space up here. All right. Questions on that? All right, so if we uh, continue, so continuing with this for a moment, pre meltdown, okay, so what did meltdown do? Well, meltdown said that we couldn't actually have kernel addresses up here, and that's a problem. Okay, so the pre meltdown virtual memory map, and I'll tell you about meltdown in a slide, uh, look like this essentially um, the kernel memory was not generally visible to the user so all of these addresses in red had uh, page table entries that said kernel use only okay um, especially the exception was there were some special dynamically linked shared objects that were up in that upper space that were uh, basically put there so that the user could do things like get time of day and so on quickly without actually having to trap into the kernel and uh, you can, you can Google VDSO to see some details on that. But uh, it was a, an optimization to try to uh, eliminate system calls for things that people might need to do rapidly. Um, every physical page is described by a page structure in Linux. They're collected together in lower physical memory, can be accessed in kernel virtual space, and linked together in various LRU lists, which I mentioned the three zones before. Uh, for 32-bit virtual memory architecture, as I said, when physical memory is less than 896 megabytes. All of the memory is mapped up top. When physical memory is uh, greater than 896 me uh, megabytes, you have to swap uh, in and out. And for 64-bit virtual memory accesses, basically all the physical memory is mapped up in this upper space. Uh, and that what that really means is that the kernel, you know, if DRAM goes from zero to something, uh, the kernel actually has a chunk of this space which is literally mapped directly to the physical DRAM uh, just to make it really easy to access uh, without translation, in a sense, uh, all of the physical memory. So uh, then what happened? Well, what happened was 2017. Okay, in 2017 was a very bad year for computer architects. Uh, there were a number of bugs security violations that were discovered that were all related directly to the fact that computer architects had been um, doing uh, prediction for a long time. They were doing branch prediction. Uh, 
they were doing uh, data value prediction, et cetera, in order to allow processors to run ahead of uh, slow operations like branches in order to get much better performance. And they were doing out of order execution as well. And so I just wanna show you some code that gives you an idea of what happens, okay? So what actually happens in a physical processor uh, these days, and, and you should take uh, 152 or 252 if you wanna learn more about this, is speculative execution says that instructions get to run ahead of the, uh, of the decision-making parts of the pipeline, like branches, or in the case um, I'm gonna show you here, it gets to run ahead of the uh, page faults that are, are for protection violations. And so this interesting little bug, which was demonstrated and kind of uh, demonstrated to, to manufacturers of processors and to Microsoft, et cetera, of operating systems back in 2017, and it was not announced to the world until 2018, is something like this, where you have an array that let's say has 256 bits, uh, 256 entries uh, in that array uh, spaced out by 4,096 bytes each. And um, I'll tell you why that spacing in a second. And you flush this all out from the cache, so there's uh, nothing in the cache, and then what you do is you say, oh, the result I want, I'm running as a pr uh, user now, is a kernel address. Okay, now what's a kernel address? So a kernel address is up here in red. Uh, I, as a user, try to access this memory. Now that shouldn't work. I should get a page fault and a segmentation violation and the process should be killed. But in, in the world of dynamic execution, what actually happens is this address gets loaded uh, temporarily into the processor registers while the violation is being checked. And so it gets loaded into the register, and then I go ahead and, and say, well, I wanna access my array, this is in my uh, uh, physical, in my um, user space, with the result times 4096. I touch that array, and then eventually what happens is, the processor says, uh, wait a minute, you're not supposed to attach to see that. And so what it does is it causes a page fault and it cleans up these registers. So this result value doesn't actually get into a register in a way that I can look at. And notice how I've done a try catch here so that even though I got a bad access, I still go on without killing the program. And now what's cool about this, I guess, if you're a um, processor architect before 2017 is, um, you know, we were doing this out of order with the assumption that this was correct, but we squashed it properly, and so there's no bad result here, okay? It's not like my program that now, after this, looks at result gets to learn anything about that kernel data. However, notice that during the time until I've caught the violation, I've actually caused one cache line to be loaded as a result. So if this result came back to, uh, you know, uh, 129, then there's a, an array entry, the 129th array entry gets loaded into the cache, and all I have to do as a user is scan through my 256 slots, and the one that doesn't have a, ca uh, a um, cache miss, which access very rapidly, tells me what the value was. So I'm finding out indirectly what the actual value is. Okay, and the patch, uh, unfortunately, was you need a different page tables for user and kernel, and so all of the optimizations that had been done over the, over the years uh, as a result of this mapping now uh, suddenly couldn't be done. And so you had to have two pages, one for the kernel and one for the user. And uh, only versions of Linux, for instance, after 4.14 was even um, able to use the, uh, the uh, ID tag in the TLB. And so um, as a result, just by changing page tables for user and kernel, for instance, uh, taking a system call, the best the kernel could do is it'd have to flush out all the TLB, go to the kernel's page table, do whatever you want, flush out all of the TLB, go back to the user. So there are multiple TLB flushes, and it, and it turned out it was about an 800% overhead just by uh, repairing this for the uh, meltdown bug. Uh, a little bit later with the version 4.14 of the uh, Linux, it was able to use the uh, um, ID tags that were on the TLB, and so you could have a separate user and kernel TLBs loaded into the same TLB at the same time 
uh, without interference. Uh, the real fix is better hardware, and that's still kind of on its way. All right, I'm going to end this out. Okay, how is it possible to get root access to a system just by viewing kernel memory? So uh, that's a good question. But um, imagine for a moment that the thing about the kernel is it's got all sorts of stuff the user is not supposed to get access to. It's got keys, it's got passwords, all of that stuff is inside the kernel because it's the one that's controlling access to the process. So the fact that you can essentially drain out all of kernel memory using this hack means that now you can see all of the information the kernel is trying to protect from processes and you can violate uh, all of the privacy constraints that processes depend on uh, between each other. So you can get passwords, you can get cryptographic keys, you can get data that's been decrypted, all of these things you can get access to because, for instance, as I mentioned, this red area has a mapping of every physical DRAM page. And so if you can look at that, you can drain the contents of every process's memory just by running this hack. So this was pretty devastating and bad. And so it really, once it was discovered, there was pretty much no way you could get by without fixing it. Okay. All righty. So um, now let's talk. I want to talk a little bit about I.O. before, uh, before we uh, go off and, um, and for spring break. So uh, so far in this course, we've been talking about managing the CPU and memory. But what about I.O.? And really, without I.O., computers are kind of useless. They're sort of like disembodied brains. Uh, maybe they're computing the last digit of pi, but you can't even tell anybody about it because they don't have any I.O. And so, really, we have thousands and millions of different devices, each one slightly different. And the question comes up pretty quickly, how can we standardize the interfaces to these devices? Um, devices are unreliable. We have media failures, transmission errors. Uh, they're unpredictable or slow. Uh, how do we deal with, uh, with that unpredictability in a way that we can give a good virtual view of the world to the processes that are running? Now, we're going to talk about virtual machines in more detail in another lecture. But really, as we started this class, we talked about how the process abstraction was a type of virtualization that we uh, sort of give, we clean up the details of the actual hardware. And uh, this has been fine talking about virtual memory, or talking about virtual memory and so on, but we haven't talked about devices. And so if you remember from way back, we showed you this figure where uh, below the red line was all the hardware that we were virtualizing and things like disk drives to load into memory, things like network cards to load into memory and for the operating system to touch. And so really there's a whole bunch of buses and who deals with that complexity, okay? Now, maybe that you don't because you're not a device person, but somebody has to, and uh, the OS uh, has to, right? And so, um, and remember these time scales. So this uh, every, numbers everyone should know from a cache uh, miss that's uh, under a nanosecond, we're nanosecond again, 10 to the minus nine, up to milliseconds, okay? 100 milliseconds is, is a 10th of a second. So we see a wide array of different times in the system, and somehow the I.O. subsystem has got a deal, okay? And in a picture, you know, we had this uh, memory hierarchy where we have disks and SSDs maybe in front of the disks and DRAM in front of the SSDs and an L3 cache and an L2 cache and an L1 cache and registers. And by the way, if you look at the first slide of this lecture, uh, you can figure out how to build an average memory access time for something that's get pulled from disk up to the processor, many layers. And off of the processor, we have I.O. controllers that let you read and write uh, your disks. The I.O. controllers have uh, wires that talk to the devices of some sort, and they have an interface that talks to the processor. And then um, devices may have something direct memory access as a way to basically pull things from the device into memory without the processor having to, to transfer every byte. So, um, you know, all of the I.O. devices you recognize are supported somehow by I.O. controllers. And processes, uh, processors, excuse me, access them by going through the controllers, uh, reading and writing commands and arguments. And we're gonna talk about that uh, in a few moments. So modern I.O. systems basically uh, are all about the I.O. Uh, or excuse me, modern systems are all about the I.O. So if you look, you know, where is the processor? Oh, that's this thing right here. 
and it's got bridges to different buses and many different types of buses and different types of devices. And really, from an interesting interest and complexity standpoint, all of this stuff is what's interesting and complicated. That processor is, it's just a processor. Uh, and, you know, as a computer architect, I, I don't really want to minimize all the cool stuff in the processor, but I want you to see all the other stuff. Okay. So, for instance, what is a bus? So, a bus is a set of wires, okay, a common set of wires, either on chip or off chip, uh, with a set of devices talking to it, and it's running a common protocol for carrying out data transfer. Um, operations like read and write, they're control lines like uh, address lines and data lines and typical many devices on some buses, other buses are point to point. A protocol is uh, something that each bus has to have which allows an initiator device to start a read or write across the bus to some other device. Um, and these buses, when they're very close to the processor, namely on chip, they're very high bandwidth, they get lower and lower bandwidth as you get away from the, the processor. So here's an example, for instance, of a PCI uh, bus, which is um, a more modern kind of architecture. You have the CPU here. It's got a memory bus that's extraordinarily fast to its uh, RAM. Um, and then a host bridge that might go to a couple of PCI bus uh, buses. And those PCI buses, uh, one of them might go to an ISA bridge. And these are the really old legacy devices like keyboards and mice. But there might be another PCI bridge, and on that second PCI uh, bus, then you might have a USB controller, and then all of these USB devices you're used to. Uh, I see we have a little bit of a, uh, a bug here with wrapping. We have a webcam and a keyboard. Sorry about that. Uh, so you can have a USB controller. You can have a, a static controller. Uh, this is a serial ATA for hard disks and scanners and so on. And so this kind of a bus hierarchy is how we plug the system together. And these buses, the PCI buses, are often the ones that you open up a, a machine and you plug cards into it, and then out the back of the machine, you've got a, a separate bus. And so the USB is a type of, it's a universal serial bus, SATA is a type of bus for disks and uh, scanners, ISA is a type of bus for legacy devices. So um, I, I'm gonna pull up a, a somewhat older processor now just to give you an idea. So inside the processor, these get pretty cool, okay? Um, if you're a computer architect, so you've got uh, four out of order cores that are doing that out of order execution. They might actually have some memory protection extensions, um, software guard extensions, so that's the SGX to build enclaves. Um, you can issue, say, up to six micro ops per cycle. So these are uh, operations where the Intel instructions that you've learned in your debuggers get compiled inside in hardware into risk instructions, that's all done in hardware, where they're run in very high-speed pipelines. We have large L3 caches with an on-chip ring bus. So this ring bus basically uh, connects with the caches, so the LLCs here, um, high bandwidth access to them over that bus. We have integrated I.O., so we might have, these are uh, high-speed DRAM, DDR uh, interfaces. We have uh, display displays, so we might have a GPU agent that talks to the displays. Etc. But these are a few I.O. devices. What's possibly more interesting is what's called the platform controller hub. So here's the processor I just showed you with some DRAM uh, and some PCI bus uh, for very high speed PCI and displays. But we've also got this platform controller hub. And that platform controller hub through a direct media interface talks to pretty much everything else. Okay, USBs and uh, LAN, so that's the Ethernet and audio and so on, low uh, the, the uh, low performance uh, controllers for some of the um, uh, old legacy devices and so on. Many types of I.O. are actually on the platform controller head. So USB, Ethernet, Thunderbolt 3, audio, BIOS, all of this stuff, disks, come off that chip. So really, I'd say the one that's, the chip that's got all the action is kind of this guy. Okay. Yeah, there's a processor and yeah, it's very cool, but this guy has all the I.O. Uh, attached to it. All right. Now, um, when we start talking about I.O., depending on what the device is, we got to start talking about things like what's our data granularity? Is it byte versus block? Some devices give us a byte at a time. You can imagine a keyboard like that. Others provide whole blocks. 
disks, networks, et cetera. We talked last time about what is the native, uh, what's the native block for a disk, and that's actually called a sector, that's like 512 bytes. But uh, oftentimes we'll read multiple sectors at a time to get what's typically the, op uh, the operating system's version of a page. Um, but still things are coming off in larger chunks. We might ask about access patterns. Are we forced to pull everything in sequentially or can we grab it randomly? So some de devices uh, are sequential in nature, okay, like networks. You can only pull things in sequentially off of them. Others, like disks, you can randomly read, okay? Um, some of them require you to continuously pull. Others generate interrupts. So um, some have transfer mechanisms where you uh, read one byte at a time uh, from them. Others have direct memory access. So these are all kind of interesting things that are handled by uh, the Linux kernel. So if, you know we've been talking all this term about different parts of the kernel. We sort of talked about process management. We've been talking about memory management. Now we're moving over to talk about some of the device control, and we'll talk about networking, and then we're going to move into file systems as well. But really. The system call interface has a uh, machine independent portion at the top. And then as we get closer and closer to the devices, they become more and more uh, like device drivers and closer to the details of the device themselves. So the goal of the IO system is to provide uniform interfaces despite a very wide range of different devices. Uh, for instance, this code, uh, F open dev something, giving you a file descriptor and then reading through uh, from that device and printing out, or in this case, we're printing out to that device, fprintf, works for all sorts of different devices. It doesn't matter if it's a file or if it's a um, network or if it's something else, okay, uh, a screen, because we've got this standard um, version that everything looks like a file. And we talked about that earlier in the term. But uh, why does this work? Well, the code that controls the devices or the device driver implements a standard interface. And we're going to try to get a flavor for what's involved in actually controlling devices as we go forward, um, probably mostly uh, next time. But we can only scratch the surface here. OK? So we want standard interfaces to devices. Block devices uh, are things like disk drives, tape drives, DVD, ROM. Uh, they access blocks of data. and Commands include things like open, read, write, seek. Raw I.O. or file system access is an option. Uh, memory map file access is possible, but the essential part about block devices is we're always pulling in blocks or chunks of data. Okay, Character devices like keyboards, mice, etc., single character at a time. And in that case, we have things like get and put. Okay? And libraries are layered on top. Network devices are actually considered a third class of device. So things like Ethernet, uh, wireless, Bluetooth, et cetera, they're different enough from both the block devices and the character devices that um, they are uh, treated separately. And they also have the socket interface, which we talked about uh, last month, I believe. And um, so the uh, Unix and Windows uh, both include socket interfaces. Um, so do the Apple uh, iOSs. The separate network protocol from network operation has things like select. Um, and the usage here is pipes and FIFOs and streams and queues and mailboxes and so on. Um, so those are the three types of devices. And you might ask, well, how does the user deal with timing? So here we also have some options. So mostly what you've been doing up till now is uh, a blocking interface or a wait interface. When the request data, like read uh, system call, it has to grab data from the device, you go to sleep. Okay, that's a blocking device. We block until the data is ready. Um, or when we write, mostly we just write the system call and the process gets put to sleep only if uh, there's not enough buffering or if the device is not ready for data yet. Non-blocking interfaces, which you can do with a lot of devices, say, don't wait. Tell me what you got now. So this is when you do a read, system call to a non-blocking interface, you get back immediately what it can give you. Okay, And how do we get a file, for instance, file uh, that we've opened, how do we turn it into a non-blocking interface? We can actually use the ioctl system call we talked before. And in this case, we return quickly from read or write. And what it tells us is how many bytes were transferred. 
Finally, there's the notion of an asynchronous interface, which is the uh, tell me later. And here, what happens is when we request data, uh, the operating system takes a pointer to the user's buffer and then uh, returns later with some sort of signal that says your, your uh, IO is ready, go for it, okay? And so notice the difference between non-blocking and asynchronous is non-blocking returns with whatever it's got. Asynchronous returns after having gotten what you asked for, okay? And so in the asynchronous case, you may wait a little longer, but you get later notified that a complete read has happened or a complete write has happened. Okay, and so typically you can open something in a blocking version and then using the IOCTL interface, IOCTL, you can uh, turn it into non-blocking or asynchronous with the right uh, calls. So how does the processor talk to the device? If you guys can bear with me for a couple of moments, I wanna um, make sure we talk a little bit uh, further. Um, so the processor, as we've been talking about, talks to memory over the processor memory bus. Uh, typically, there are bus adapters and an interrupt controller talking to the CPU, and from those bus adapters, then we can put our device controllers on there, okay? And so a device controller is a piece of hardware that is uh, plugged into the bus that manages some device. And here I'm showing you a, a screen, for instance. And inside the controller are a set of control registers, which lets you say, for instance, what's the resolution, uh, you know, what kind of features are you asking for? And the addressable memory, potentially you can read and write data directly on the device controller as well. Okay, so it contains a set of registers that can be read and written and uh, may contain memory for requests. So these are queues or bitmap images. And uh, regardless of the complexity of the connections in buses, uh, which is often hidden, the complexity of the buses is usually hidden from people by the hardware. Uh, but there's two ways that a typical processor can get access to the, to the uh, hardware. One is an I.O. instruction. There aren't too many processors that directly have I.O. instructions, but um, x86 is one of them. And then um, a good example is out. OX21 will actually send a, um, send a request to uh, register 21. Okay? The other is memory mapped I.O. So this is a case where load and store instructions will actually uh, go over the bus and directly access the uh, hardware just like it was uh, a, um, just like it was a cache read or write, except that it's talking to the hardware. So this is the last thing I wanna show before we end up today. So here's an example of the physical address space. So normally physical address space is only, we've been only talking about that is where the DRAM is, but it's also where the controllers are. And if you look here in a memory mapped case, the hardware maps control registers and display memory to the physical address spaces. And then uh, the processor just writes to display memory directly. Okay, and in many cases, these addresses are actually covered by the, um, covered by the uh, PTEs in the virtual address space. And what's interesting about this is just by giving, the, just by having the processor write to this range of addresses, for instance, from 8000F to 8000FFFF, we uh, write in the display memory, and in many cases, those writes appear directly as dots on the screen, okay? Or when we write, uh, for instance, this command queue is an example where we might actually write graphics description, like a set of triangles to draw, and just by writing to them, we have set up a, uh, a set of figures to draw, and uh, maybe we write to a command register down here by writing that address, and as a result, suddenly your, uh, your image is drawn. Okay, so that's the idea of memory mapped IO. Okay, and in many cases you can protect this with address translation, and the ones that you can protect with address translation, you can actually give direct access to the user to do this memory mapped IO under the circumstances where that's allowed. Okay, now before I end on this, are there any questions on uh, memory mapping? Okay, we're gonna, um, we'll pick up more discussion of uh, direct memory access uh, when we get back after the holiday, but I'm gonna give you an in conclusion. Uh, we've been talking about uh, IO device types here, many, many different speeds, different access patterns like block devices, character devices, network devices, uh, different access timing like blocking, non-blocking, asynchronous. Uh, we've been talking about IO controllers, which is hardware that controls the device. 
the processor accesses uh, through I.O. instructions or load stores the physical memory. And uh, basically, we're going to next talk about notification mechanisms. So we're going to bring back interrupts. You remember that, where the only interrupt we really talked about that was interesting uh, up till now was the timer interrupt. Um, but now we're going to talk about how devices can use interrupts to notify the operating system that they need service. And we're going to bring back our discussion to device drivers and look at how the device driver really provides a clean interface from uh, the higher levels of the operating system through to the, sp the specifics of the devices. All righty. Um, thank you, everybody. I hope you have a safe and uh, relaxing uh, holiday. We will uh, pick this up. When, uh, when we get back. And uh, we will tell you the details of the midterm, but as, uh, as I told you, uh, pretty much everything up till the next lecture is uh, gonna be fair game. I'm gonna try to get these lectures up till today um, with the um, uh, closed captioning. We already have closed captioning on lectures uh, 13 and 14. And um, I hope you have a great holiday and um, talk to you later. Bye now. <laughs>